live session. Uh, here, it, there it goes. Let me start that again. So welcome everyone on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, this is the Gardening the Panhandle live session. Uh, we're talking about weeds today. Uh, Gardening the Panhandle live, is this, if this is your first one, this is where the uh, horticulture agents in the Northwest District of Florida work to bring you some programming online that you can catch on during lunch. And we kind of try to address topics that uh, our clientele have been asking us. And we get some panelists together to answer your questions. So when you sign up, you can ask a question. We provide you with all the information you need, hopefully, to deal with your issue. Again, today we're talking weeds. My name is Mark Tanzig. I'm going to be your MC for today. I am the horticulture agent in Leon County, so over in Tallahassee. Uh, as far as our other panelists today, we have, I'm going to start with Matt Lawler. So Matt Lawler, tell us where you're from and what your title is. Hey, I'm Matt Lawler. I'm the commercial horticulture agent in Santa Rosa County. All right, thank you, Matt. And then we also got Josh Chris. I'm Josh. I'm the residential horticulture agent for Santa Rosa County. So we got two Santa Rosa people on. Very good. And then our newest extension agent faculty joining us today is Miss Abby Payne. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Abby. Hi, um, I'm Abby Payne, and I'm the commercial and environmental horticulture agent for Jackson County. All right, Jackson County, that's Mariana for, for all you folks. Uh, well, we're talking weed control, okay? So, well, and just to let everyone know, so on Zoom, Zoom attendees, you can put your questions in the chat or the Q&A, and we got people that are going to be watching that. And uh, if you got any follow-up questions that we haven't an uh, answered or discussed, feel free to put them there. If you're on Facebook watching this, because we're on Facebook Live as well, if you have questions along the way, you can put them in your in the comments of Facebook. And we got someone watching that chat stream as well, and we'll answer and we'll post those questions. We'll answer them live here for you. We're supposed to be here for an hour. Uh, if we finish up early, we'll let you go. Uh, but we're talking weeds, so there's usually lots of questions around this topic. So please just ask away. And so before we get started into the questions, uh, I want to review for the panelists this idea of integrated pest management. Uh, we call it IPM. And what is one of the, I'm going to ask you all, what is one of the most important things, y'all, before we start dealing with any pest, what do we need to do? Matt, Josh, Abby, what do you think? Idea. You need to know what you're dealing with to know how to approach controlling it. Correct. So the most important thing before you get started controlling any pest, that includes, you know, weeds, but that's also insects and disease, is we need to make sure we identified it properly. And because once we know what it is, we can get more information to better you know, tell us and give us a plan of action to control it. How do we do that with weeds? Y'all, there's a lot of plants out there. What's the what are some methods you guys use to properly identify the, the weeds in your garden? I usually bring them into my local extension office. Oh, really? Do you live in Santa Rosa County or are you take them to some other office and have them have to deal with it? Usually Santa Rosa County. <laughs> okay, good. Good plan. You can bring plants to your local extension office and we love identifying weeds for you. Any other ideas out there, Josh, Abby, Matt? Well, it just depends on what level of experience you have with weed identification but I typically try to look at the seed head if it's already seeded out because that'll kind of give you an indication on what stage of growth it is and where it's at and what it is etc. Very good yep so a lot of times with plants we want to see the reproductive parts to help us really figure out exactly what it could be. Josh you got any other tips for properly identifying that weed? Uh, well, I can tell you that pretty much everybody that's listening to us probably says that you can go to Google and if you tip on, click on the little search bar and click on the little camera, you can figure out what it is. Um, is that's that always right? Probably about 40% of the time <laughs> it's correct. Um, there is a lot more to it than that. That will get you in the right neighborhood. So you'll probably know kind of what it is. And then there's a lot more steps beyond that as far as leaf configuration and and reproductive structures and things of that nature that we really need to dig down into. Correct. Yeah. And then one more I'll add is so with your handy dandy smartphones, right, there are some good apps The my favorite app to tell folks about is the Seek app, which is kind of run by iNaturalist. I always try to trick it, right, because I'm a botany boy. I love plants and I'm always trying to take weird pictures of plants I already know, see if it can figure it out. Right. And it's surprising how well it does. So 
uh, you can use something like that to help, but it's best to take it to an expert and get some, you know, a good uh, verified identification, uh, because then we can really try to get you a, a plan, a better plan to, um, you know, uh, find out exactly how to take care of that weed. So then before we get into these questions again, when we're controlling weeds, first of all, what is a weed versus a wildflower or a, a, some other plant? What makes it a weed, y'all? They didn't know I was going to ask them these questions, so they're just on the hot seat here. What? How do we know it's a weed? Usually we just say it's a plant out of place. Yep, plant out of place. So what Matt Lawler thinks is a weed, I might think is a beautiful wildflower, and I want it to grow in my yard, right? So it's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, if you like the plant where it's at, it's not a weed, right? If it's a rose bush coming out of the crack of the sidewalk, you know, it's a weed, perhaps, right? Maybe you want it growing out of the sidewalk, who knows? But it's all in your mind, right? If you think it's a weed, uh, it's a weed. Now, there are some of the weeds that are definitely bad, right? So invasive plants are one little special category there where you might like that Mexican petunia or lantana or something like that, but those are invasive plants that are kind of automatically given a weed designation. We want to take those out. Uh, there was another question I had for you. I kind of lost it there. So we talked about making sure we properly identify the plant. Uh, some tools to help us. What actually is a weed? Oh, here it is. When we're dealing with weeds, is it likely that we're ever going to eradicate it forever and it's gone for good? Was that for us? That's for you guys, yeah. Um, eradication is not a really viable strategy because you're going to spend all manner of money and time and effort trying to do it. Um, but your neighbor didn't do any of that. So the second you get it eradicated from your yard, seeds and you're right back where you started so eradication is not a good strategy right a bird flies over and drops some more seeds down so most of the time when we're talking about weed control really we're talking about right suppressing it right getting it to a level that we can handle and that we're happy with because eradication is sometimes this unrealistic goal and you know we don't want you just spinning your wheels over and over and over again and spending all your money because some of these weeds are really problematic uh, and it's going to be really hard to get a hold of them Okay, so now I'm going to get into the questions you guys know are coming. Okay, you ready? Everyone looks ready. Okay, good. Let's see. The first one. First, we're going to start with some of the more problematic weeds. We're going to handle some of those questions. Uh, then we're going to get into some weed control methods and you know what you all think about it. And then we got some kind of like weed related questions that we'll get into. But uh, first of all, I'm going to go right to Abby, our new agent, and she's going to tell us. Is there a non-toxic solution to dealing with the dreaded dollar weed? Well, to start off, we need to talk about what dollar weed actually is. Um, so I was always taught growing up, my grandmother calls them silver dollars, which is not correct because they're not silver, they're green, obviously. <laughs> um, but they do look like the silver dollar. Right, they're know, big. Aquatic specimen, whatever you want to call them. Um, and they are big. And they love moisture. Um, a lot of times, a lot of, I guess, FWC people indicate that if there's a wetland or a marshy area, you will see dollar weed or pennywort as a scientific name show up. So that's a good indication of water retention. Um, if you're having any problems in your yard, um, if you're near any body of water, it may pop up. Um, but to be able to eradicate it, if you're wanting a non-toxic solution, the best is going to be just hand pulling. Um, but you need to make sure that the white rhizomes on the stem are pulled with it, because if not, you're just going to keep spreading it. Um, it's spore-like, so it's just going to constantly be coming back up. Um, there's If you do a non-toxic solution or a toxic solution, it can get expensive, so hand pulling is probably the best mechanism you're going to use. Yeah, a lot of people ask us, if there is there a a way to get rid of this weed without using any herbicides and there sure is you get that on your hands and knees and you yeah. pull that stuff out uh, that's always a great non-toxic method and it's great for exercise too so why not uh lawler i think you got something else for us maybe on dollar weed yeah i had one that was a question about um, killing dollar weeds in an aquatic situation or pennywort in an aquatic situation so um you, you could use some of the same chemistry uh, you know, it might be a little bit harder to to dig up some of those rhizomes if they're in water. So uh, you could use uh, diquat or glyphosate or 2,4-D. 
as long as those products that you purchase have an aquatic label. So you need to make sure to look at the label and see if it's okay to use in either a pond or a lake or, or whatever water body that you're dealing with. Yeah, and like uh, Abby said, you know, these are, it's a native wetland plant, right? So uh, the first indication, if you've got a bunch of dollar weed in your yard, uh, what what's going on with too much irrigation, standing water, you know, wet areas? Um, if it's naturally wet, you're going to have problems. Um, that's where that suppression is your main goal there, right? It's probably not it, going to be able to eradicate. And it's not a bad addition to a salad. There you go. It's edible, right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, it's not too bad. A little peppery flavor, I think. Uh, next up here, Josh, you get the next big pain in the butt weed. And that is, uh, a lot of people call it nut grass. We like yeah. to call it nut sedge because it's not truly a grass, it's a sedge. It's just, so please tell really me you got a, a magic solution <laughs> for nut sedge, Josh, please. Um, there's no magic solution. The first thing we need to do though is ID this correctly. I can't tell you how many times I've heard globe sedge called nut sedge. Um, I hear it all the time. And I deal in Santa Rosa, I deal with, or I hear about globe sedge far more than I hear about nutsedge. Um, you also need to understand the biology of this or the physiology of this plant and that it grows underground and it spreads by seed above ground. And so hand pulling can be effective in really small patches of it. Um, but if you're getting in a situation where you're in turf grass or something like that, you're probably not gonna wanna have to dig up a bunch of your turf to get to those little nodes that are underground. So very often a, a glyphosate or some sort of systemic herbicide is actually going to be a better way to deal with it. Um, on top of that, you probably need to realize this is another one where if you cut down on your watering of your long grasses, you're going to have less of a problem with this. They do like to have a much more moist environment. So if you can cut down that moisture, you can actually solve a lot of these problems in your turf grasses before you have them. Great. Um... Yeah, so watching those, you know, cultural practices, right, that we talk about of, of watching that water use. Um, yeah, nut sedge is a pain in the butt. Uh, I don't like having to deal with it. Uh, I forgot to mention to everyone listening, there's, when we answer a question, we're going to put some resources into the chat screen. So uh, following every answer, there'll be some comments over on the Zoom or even on Facebook as well. And you can click on those and, and it'll send you some, some more resources. Next up, let's see, we talked <clears throat> sedges. Um, who's going to be doing my doveweed? I think I lost something here, but doveweed. Um, let's see, Lawler, what you got? Uh, doveweed is another really problematic uh, plant, weed in our landscapes. Uh, so what do we got for doveweed control, Matt? Uh, well, in my opinion, duckweed <laughs> makes a nice turf, so I would probably just <laughs> leave it. Uh, but it does have a pretty, pretty fine um, leaf to it, so it's almost like a grass, uh, which unfortunately makes it kind of hard to control. Um, so uh, it does. It, it's a it's a summer annual, so we we can spray some pre-emergent products to help control duckweed. Um, so something containing the active ingredient pendimethalin would be a good option. Um, and there's some different mixtures with pendimethalin uh, that you might could try. Um, or uh, maybe a product with the active ingredient, uh, esmetolachlor would be another option. Um, and there's some other um, pre-emergent or pre-emergent herbicides that you can purchase as well that will work on duckweed. Um, it's gonna be pretty hard to control um, post-emergent. Um, so after it's already germinated and out of the ground, um, so in those situations, you might have to choose a non-selective product and just spot spray it. Um, so like a glyphosate product or um, an acid, there's some different acids out there and some horticultural vinegars that might be an option. Yeah, that one's really tough to deal with. It's not going to be like a one season and you got it under control thing. It's going to be years of kind of trying to work on it, especially if it's a big infestation. And, you know, Matt has got the sometimes the right idea there about, you know, it's green. It kind of looks like grass, you know, sometimes you might just want to lean into it and pretend it's actually your lawn. Yeah. Um, my neighbor has spent quite a bit of time trying to get rid of doveweed. He tried soil solarization, so I don't, you know, that might come up a little bit later, but basically covering it with plastic and heating it up. The doveweed pushed the plastic up out of the, the ground. Um, so, oh, wow. you know, it's a tough one to work on. 
another one where eradication may not be a realistic expectation. You know, hopefully you can uh, get it to some tolerable level. That's what, uh, that's the idea there with Dubweed. Or like Matt, you just, you know, just in, you know, roll with it and go with it. <laughs> okay, here is, uh, this is going to be, actually, let me skip around. I'm going to go to Abby and Abby Johnson Grass. Can you describe a little bit what Johnson Grass is? And can you give us any recommendations for controlling Johnson Grass in a, an organic garden situation? Johnson Grass to me seems almost similar to how to maintain crabgrass. It's uh -huh. very invasive and it will grow <laughs> very quickly. Um, it is a pain in the butt if you don't <laughs> like it. Um, it grows very thick. As far as if it's organic, you have very limited options. Again, it's going to be hand pulling your weeds, um, hand tilling, any type of mechanism that way. And it too, if you're pulling it by the root, that almost will be more effective if you're trying to eradicate. Like we said, eradication is not always feasible, but that's probably the best option that you have. Yeah, in, in organic settings, you're really limited. So that horticultural vinegar type stuff you know, it might do something on the young ones, but yeah, I think I'm with you, Abby, the hand pulling Johnson. It's a big, tall one, right? You'll know right. you got Johnson grass because it's like over your head. It's, it's big and tall. So sorry if you have Johnson grass in your organic vegetable garden, because it's, right. it's a, it's a hand pulling option there. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go back to you, Matt Lawler and this one. So dove weed, nut sedge, those Johnson grass, non-native species that are problematic. We did talk about dollar weed, a native plant that can be a problematic in the landscape. The next one, Matt, is poison ivy, right? No one really wants poison ivy around the beds, around the landscape. It's a great native plant. It's very valuable to wildlife, but we don't want it in our landscapes always necessarily. So tell us what we can do about poison ivy, Matt. Okay, well, if you look at the publication that we'll post in the chat you'll see that it first tells you you can hand pull it carefully <laughs> <laughs> be very careful that's, yeah that's that's a pretty bad advice that for me <laughs> even just walking close to it is enough to stir up the oils and, and oh wow have, have a reaction on my arms uh, just in places where i've already had poison ivy um so uh, you can you can look for some non-selective herbicides, uh, anything containing glyphosate, um, maybe something uh, with uh, some triclopyr. Or, uh, the, sometimes you'll see some herbicides that'll say weed and brush killer or something like that, and they'll have the active ingredients to to kill poison ivy. Um, but even for me, I'd have to be careful spraying it. I'd probably wear more protective equipment than is labeled. Uh, for that particular product, um, just to keep from stirring it up too much and, and having a rash break out. Yeah, Matt, how do you do? Do you eat mangoes? Oh yeah, uh, mangoes. The the skin and the sap from mangoes. I cannot handle that either. So. Yeah, they're they're closely related. So some people are really sensitive to poison ivy have trouble eating mangoes. Uh, Triclopyr. I have my daughter's really sensitive to poison ivy, so I'm really kind of you know, on top of it, especially where people walk and stuff and park in the driveway. <clears throat> and this poison ivy killer, there's actually a product often at the big box stores. And that's the triclopyr ingredient that works really well uh, on the poison ivy. Uh, you know, you got to just be careful if it's going up young trees or something. If you're spraying the leaves, hmm. you don't want to get it on bark of young trees. Uh, but it can be managed pretty well. So that one's not too bad. Um, let's see. Josh, ooh, Josh, here's a here's a tough one for you. Torpedo grass. Uh, in the chat, everyone out there in Zoom land or Facebook land, tell us if you got torpedo grass in your landscape because it's it's hard to deal with. Josh, what should they do? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a small bit of it, you can hand dig it, but the roots can get kind of the rhizome on it can get pretty deep, so you're going to be hand digging pretty deep. Um, and on top of that, if you don't get every bit of that rhizome, there's a good chance it's coming right back at you. And so you got to be real careful about that. Um, there's not really a great pre-emergent to solve it either. So post-emergents are going to be about your only real 
uh, methodology for them. And so that's again going to be glyphosate. And so you're going to have to be very careful with glyphosate, particularly if you have torpedo grass that's in your um, in your plant beds, because if you just willy nilly go in there and apply glyphosate, it's going to kill everything. That's just what it does. Um, but it is a systemic, so it will get down there to those rhizomes so you don't have to dig through a bunch of stuff. Um, there is another one called Imazapur, but it is not, and that's a chemical, it's not a brand, um, but it's not really labeled for landscape use. And so you're kind of taking your, your, your risking your other plants if you, if you use these things that are not labeled and you're not supposed to go off the label anyway. And so if, being as it's not, it wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, but the glyphosate is rated for it, but it's going to take multiple applications and you're going to have to be on top of it. And if you can catch it early enough, hopefully you can dig a little bit of it out. Um, but if you do, just make sure that you get that rhizome completely. Yeah, and I, but we've been hearing more and more folks in Tallahassee area uh, with this stuff sneaking in their sod, right? And so they got a nice new sod lawn put down. And then a little while later, you know, torpedo grass starts popping up. It's real difficult to deal with, uh, like we've been mentioning, and uh, glyphosate, uh, the neighbor's got some zoysia, right, mixed in with the zoysia, and he is painting mm -hmm. the with the little torpedo grass stalks with glyphosate to try to get a hold of it, and I think it's working pretty well. Uh, someone mentioned they have torpedo grass in a muley grass bed next to a seawall, and so they're really cautious around with herbicides near water. And yep. so I just wanted to point out, David, that there is a glyphosate product labeled for water. Uh, help me out. That's rodeo, right, y'all? Rodeo? I think that's rodeo. Uh, I think so. Anyway, there's a glyphosate product labeled for the water, and that one would be safe. Uh, but you still want to be careful. Use all the PPE and all that stuff. I wanted to catch everyone. We've been mentioning pre-emergent and post-emergent. Um, Pre-emergent herbicides you put out before you ever see the weeds break the ground. Post-emergent herbicides is once you basically can see the weed, you're going to want to use these post-emergent products that absorb through the foliage. Pre-emergents kind of stop the roots from developing as those seeds sprout. So you got to be really careful on timing of those. Okay, uh, Matt Lawler. <clears throat> I'm going to have two back-to-back -back ones for you, Matt. So the first one is another annoying uh, invasive species, popcorn tree or Chinese tallow, uh, sapia, it used to be sapia now, it's triatica, I guess. Uh, what do we do to get rid of popcorn tree? Okay, um, so popcorn trees really like wet areas, um, so they are a problem if you've got some wet spots in your yard or, or low areas. Um, so some of the best, or probably the best option is to use a cut step method with triclopure. Um, so you'll go in and you'll actually cut the tree um, down and just leave a stump and then go um, around the outer edge of that stump with the triclopure. So just make sure you get like a ring um, that you're coating on the top of that stump um, or just coat the whole stump if it's smaller. That way you're getting good coverage. Um, if they are uh, smaller plants or, or just little saplings and you, and you don't mean to really cut them, but you could spray them with the triclopure product or do your um, glove method that you discussed earlier about painting, painting stuff on the plant material. Um, now, okay. the only the only thing with that is because they do like to grow in wetter areas, if it is an area with standing water, um, just make sure that the product that you purchase is approved for aquatic use. Yeah, and anyone out there wondering how would you know, uh, you just read that label attached to the product and right, usually right up at the beginning, it'll tell you where you can use that product and you want to make sure if it's a wet spot that it says, you know, aquatic uh, sites. Okay, oh, Lala, you got one more. Uh, some of these annoying weeds that show up in lawns that have those, you know, they're kind of like woody plants with deep roots, you know, like beggar weeds. Uh, I mostly think of like the beggar weeds, the desmodiums, the little, you know, hitchhiker type plants. Sure. Uh, what might be the best way to, to deal with those? Okay, so um, I think a spurge was one of the other ones listed mm -hmm. on that. And spurge in particular doesn't like any nutrients. So it's gonna grow at areas that are, uh, you know, have poor nutrition. So 
I would recommend getting a soil sample before anything and just seeing, you know, what kind of nutrients are available in that area. And maybe it's just a spot um, that hadn't had some fertilizer in a while, if, if it's in a lawn. Um, so for, for a lawn situation, I, I would recommend um, either a pre-emergent product like we've discussed before, um, it, you know, in, in uh, the spring, early spring, or um, some of the post-emergent products that have three ingredients in them, so they might be called three-way um, or something like that. Uh, they're going to have some 2,4-D in them um, and some other active ingredients that would be a good option uh, to control those weeds. If it's in an ornamental setting, um, and I wasn't quite sure if that question was more geared towards around shrubs and stuff, that there are some products that you can apply over the top. So let's say you've got like a ground cover, like uh, some kind of juniper or, or some of the other ground cover options, then, then you could use some of these products, um, something that contains clethodim or uh, oxyfluorophen. Um, and there's some other options in that publication that we'll post. Um, it's got a, a big table of things that you can spray or um, apply as a granule over the top of some landscape areas. Um, if that's not an option, then you're just gonna have to go back to your spot spray um, with something containing glyphosate. And then uh, I know that we might have a question later about organic or natural options, but there are some um, horticultural vinegars and some different acids that are available as an organic option for weed control. Okay, thanks. And sometimes I'll tell folks that they just got a couple of them here and there, just, you know, back to Abby's thing of just pull them by hand, right? Just identify sure. them, yank them out. Um, might be a good first way to do it and keep scouting, right? make sure they don't keep popping up. All right, so we've gone through some of our troublesome weeds. <clears throat> I haven't heard from Abby in a while, so I'm going to ask, now we're going to get into some of these like methods of weed control. How can we, how can we slow them down? So Abby, what do you think about the difference between river rock or mulch and which might be better at keeping weeds out of a landscape bed? Well, to me, I think it could go 50-50 because there's benefits to both. And it just depends on the preference. And also, I guess, whatever landscape you're wanting to install um, in your home area or wherever you're putting it in. Um, for mulch, you can retain more moisture um, within the ground. And it does do a little bit better about blocking out sun to where some of those weeds cannot come back up. Um, and it also can be aiding in your ground fertility. So you can, the mulch will break down every year. You have to replace it. So that could be a composting tool to use. Um, but for rock, you have more drainage if you have a drier area that you're trying to cover. So the water or rain or whatever you're using for irrigation can leach more. Um, you're reaching more ground, can boost your plants, but that also can um, add more moisture for your weeds to grow. So it just really depends. Um, to me, I prefer mulch over rock because it is more cost effective to use mulch than certain landscaping rocks. It can get quite pricey. Um, and rock too, you have the risk of building up algae and green and it, it can get kind of gross. So um, my preference is mulch, but you do what's best for you. So, Yeah, I mean, either way, uh, Abby, either way, do you think our weeds never going to be a problem? They're Maybe always going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Like we said, there's not a 100% eradication a solution. Um, one versus the other, it's preference. Yeah. But there's always going to be weeds no matter what you do. <laughs> yep. Yep, that's true. But gardeners love to work, I think mm -hmm. I notice. And so we just love to keep busy. And weeds, right. what better than weeds to keep us busy all the time outside? Uh, Josh, uh, here's a great question. So Florida Friendly Landscaping, this is some things that the extension agents across the state um, promote to citizens. Um, Florida Friendly Landscaping principles, right, using less pesticides and using things like mulch to reduce weeds. And so the kind of the question is, you know, the neighbor has this FFL yard. She spends a lot of time weeding. Meanwhile, on the other side, they're just mowing down the weeds all the time. Is there a solution that's better? Like, what's better, weeding all the time or mowing? What's well, your that take? Would kind of, that would kind of depend. So we need our turf grasses because our turf grasses do a lot. Of, they have a lot of ecological services for us. So we need those and we need our landscape beds because they are going to provide for our pollinators. So it's really better to have a mixture of both in your yard if you can if you can swing it. 
Now, as far as weeding all the time, um, I think a lot of people never think of their landscape beds as its own little ecology. And so when we say ecology, we're always talking about competition between different organisms. So if we can create an environment that speaks to or helps the, the species that we want there, but takes away the resources from the species that we, we don't want there, um, that'll cut down a lot on that weeding. Um, if we plant something that we know is going to fill out that space and it's going to fill out that space and shade out those weed plants, we know that we can we can plant those types of plants. So that would be right place, right, right place, right plant, right plant, right place. Sorry, I said that backwards. Um, and so we know that it's going to fill up that space and it's going to shade out those weeds naturally. We know that we can use our mulches to, to shade out those weeds as best we can. Um, some other things we can do is cut back on our irrigation. We, people love to water. They think Florida's hot. I need to water constantly. You don't need to water quite as much as you think you do. So you really do need to get used to the, the initial signs of wilt in your plants and wait until you start to see those before you water. And then only water a little bit because a little water goes a long way. Um, for turf grasses, for instance, we always say half to three quarters of an inch. People never uh, equate that to the fact that you're saturating the top nine inches of soil. So a little bit of water goes a long way. And also, and this is going to be a recurring theme, you'll notice if you cut back on your water, then a lot of things like your dollar weed will go away. A lot of things like your spurges will go away. A lot of things, a lot of different weeds will go away because they want that water. So if you can cut back on your water and only water as much as you need, you create that environment that's beneficial for the plants you want. Same thing with fertilizers, same things with uh, mulches and other things of that nature. Basically provide an environment for the plants that you want that takes away resources from the plants that you don't want and you'll cut down on that weeding. Josh, I'm going to stay with you too. The what do you think which is the better choice or the more reasonable choice, pulling or spraying weeds to kill them? If you had a you know, what's your take on that one? That will depend heavily once again on weed ID and understanding the physiology of that plant. For instance, if you have a sedge and you pull it and you don't get all of it, it's going to grow right back. So that one's probably going to be more beneficial to spray and spray with something that's going to get down into the root system and take care of the root system for you. So that would be a systemic herbicide. Um, on the other hand, if it's something like chamber bitter, you can pull those right out of the ground. Now, when you do pull chamber bitter out of the ground, that little teaspoon of soil that's on it is not worth it. <laughs> Pull it right out of the ground and throw it right into a bucket or right into a bag. If you shake it, you're going to spread the seeds. So you have to understand what your weeds are and how they're designed and how they're built. Um, but if it's a shallow root system, pulling is probably more beneficial. If it's something that has a very intricate root system, spraying is probably your better way to go. Yeah, a lot of times we tell our master garden volunteers here because, you know, we, we've all learned that you got to get the root. Right? You got to get that root. Uh, with annual plants, especially annuals towards the end of their season, it may not be as important to get the root. Just get that stuff out of there before it goes to sea, right? Because those roots are going to die there soon at the end of the season. And it's mostly making sure you don't let any more seeds fall down to, you know, be a nuisance the following season. So uh, one of our favorite answers around here always at the extension office is it depends, right? So another thing that would go into it, Josh, right, is how big of an area you're talking about, right? If it's a huge, you know, acre of invasive plants, weedy or yeah. spraying is probably your better option whereas if it's For just sure. one or two here and there just yeah go ahead and hand pull them so mm -hmm. you know a lot of a lot of things depend on that answer and when you go to your local extension office we'll ask you all these questions and try to help you figure out the best uh, route to control okay let's see Lawler, i think we already talked on this but uh, what's the best organic weed control besides removing them by hand? So we didn't really get into it yet. So tell us, Matt, what are the, our organic options besides just pulling by hand? Yeah, and, and that one, I, I wasn't sure it, it said non-chemical, but I, I did have some chemical options because even th no things um, are listed organic doesn't mean they're, they're still not a chemical. So um, I mentioned that the horticulture will horticultural vinegar before, um, so that might be a, a spray option. Um, and some of those could be organic materials. You just have to look and see if they're on the label, if it says that it's organic listed or OMRI listed, O-M-R-I. Um, and there, there are some different acids that might also be OMRI listed. Uh, as far as other options besides pulling, um, I would recommend one of our cultural practices would would be using mulch or some different landscape fabrics. 
uh, to try to deter those weeds from um, coming out past the soil. So hopefully bend some of them that might not work on some of our nut sedges or other things that um, nut sedge is really weird. It, it, it comes out with folded leaves so that it's stronger and it can pierce through plastic and, and other materials, like sidewalks and things like that. Uh, so uh, that, that's one option. Uh, so that they do offer some like propane burners, so some like almost like a flamethrower. I, I just uh, got one. Go through. Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> cool. it works all right. Uh, yeah, I was. I wonder with some of those. I think it would work more if you're just spot spraying stuff rather than setting the whole yard on fire. <laughs> um, so that that's another organic option um, that you might want to consider. And um, even if you are, if you do want to do a, a mulch, um, you also should consider putting a, a landscape fabric down first, and then and then putting mulch down to help form a, a weed barrier. And Matt, these some of these uh, herbicides that are organic, right? OMRI certified, OMRI. You mentioned the vinegar and some of the acids. <clears throat> are they necessarily safer for us? No, so you need to look at the label and see what um, protective equipment you need to wear. So we usually use the acronym PPE, so personal protective equipment, that'll be listed on the label. Um, and some of those acids and, I mean, vinegar is an acid, um, they can they can burn you <laughs> in no time. So you need to be very yeah. careful uh, not to get them on your skin or in your eyes. Um, so yeah, a lot of those products, especially. yeah, a lot of those products will say to wear safety glasses or goggles and um, some long gloves, long sleeves. Yeah, I think some of them are actually rated at a, a higher signal word than even some of our more conventional ones. So, you know, most of our products we use for the homeowners are caution label products, we call them, but there's some that are warning label because they're so, um, they can be bad for your skin and your eyes. Um, so right. be careful just because it's organic doesn't mean it's necessarily safer for you to use it. Um, we got a question that I will open up to the group. Uh, it was a Q&A question here, but it's uh, some of these herbicides, you know, or do we have to worry about these herbicides getting into groundwater? And so can we give us examples or, you know, how do we know if some of the products we're using are safe or not for, you know, groundwater concerns? Anyone want to jump on that? So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh... There are some products and, and a lot of times you'll be able to find out or you can either search on the web uh, for their solubility or it'll um, give you some information um, on the label, especially it'll, you know, specifically say, you know, may um, be a hazard to groundwater. Um, so uh, Florida has an organo oxen rule. Um, so you can look that up on like the Florida Department of Agriculture's website. Um, and I'll have some more information about products like uh, atrazine, where um, they can they can readily go into groundwater. That that would be more of a concern um, if you have a sandier soil because um, it'll leach um, rather than uh, run off so much on a heavier soil when it comes to groundwater contamination. Yeah, and Matt's right. Usually, right there at the right, usually towards the beginning of the label, there's these environmental um, concerns or these environmental precaution type area on your label. And it tells you real straightforward, this, you know, um, can be problematic for groundwater. I forget the exact languages, but it, it's right there on the label usually. So if you're in, if you're curious, you can look there. And if you don't like the, what it says, then you find another product or get that on your hands and knees and start pulling. Uh, where am I at? I'm going to ask Josh a question about uh, lawns. So I have a lawn. It's, you know, when I start looking close, it looks to be about 50% or more of just actual weeds, right? So what do I do? Do I spray them and hope for the best? Do I kill everything and resod it? What would be your recommendations for a lawn that's pretty eat up with weeds? Um. So typically, if it's not, if it's 50% or somewhere in that range, we like to say that you can probably recover your grass. The first thing that you're going to want to start to investigate, though, because the best defense in a lawn system against weeds, because remember, it's still an ecology, so give that plant what it wants. Why isn't your grass being very prolific? All of our grasses here are creepers, and they like to grow on themselves, and so why isn't it doing that? 
Um, if you have pH issues, sometimes we get people that want to want to plant zoysia in a lawn that's a 5.5 pH, and those two things just don't jive. So maybe you're not planting the right type of grass. You might be watering a little bit too much. If you're watering too much, then you're going to get some open spots, and that's going to invite weeds. So those cultural practices, you really want to hammer those home again. You want to look at the type of grass you have and figure out what it wants and then give it what it wants. Um, on top of that, a, a good way to start doing it, since we do have two seasons of weed here, I always like to say that the, the same reason that a bunch of us moved down here from the north is it gets too cold in the winter, and so the weeds have done that too. And so we have two seasons of, um, of weeds here. Start a pre-emergence program. Start uh, right about October when those nights start to cool off a little bit. Go ahead and figure out what type of pre-emergence will work in your turf grass and go ahead and apply that in October and do that same thing in February. Um, up here in the north, it's somewhere between February 15th and March 1st that we want to put our pre-emergence down. Keep in mind for that February one, you're going to have to do it again a little bit later in the spring because different triggers for different seeds. Um, sometimes it's temperature, sometimes it's light. So as those days get a little bit longer, different types of seeds are going to germinate. So you're going to have to do it again. Um, but if you get into that pre-emergence program and you start changing your cultural practices to the things that really benefit your turf grass that you have, your turf grass is going to come back and those weeds are going to those weeds are going to die back. It's going to take a little bit of time. It's not going to be a one season solution, but you can recover a grass. You can recover a lawn system that's 50 percent weeds. Yeah, it's a pretty decent plan. Make sure the grass is happy first, right? Yeah. Uh, OK. Okay, we're at 140, so we've done pretty good. I got an I got a question for you, Matt Lawler. All right, these stinking squirrels, they keep burying their dang nuts and forgetting where they put them. And now all these things are, you know, pecans, oak trees, they're popping up in my landscape bed. And I try yanking them, and man, they're hard to get out. What do I do? Okay, well, you shoot the squirrels. <laughs> no. Well, I'm um, in the city of Tallahassee. That's not going to be cool, man. All right, so you, you use a, a slingshot for your squirrels. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, they, they can be an issue. So, you know, some of those weed bearers that we talked about uh, with the landscape fabrics and, and mulching hopefully would deter them a little bit. Um, if you do put down the landscape fabric and mulch on top, make sure that you change out your mulch um, mostly on a yearly basis because it's just going to turn the dirt for them to plant stuff in anyway. Um, you know, you, you could uh, do some, uh, besides hand pulling, you could do some burning like we talked about uh, with your flamethrower or um, maybe use a, a spot spray treatment or even, um, you know, they, they make some different um, equipment that can, it's almost like a sponge or, or a cloth that you can, um, or a, like a barbecue mop that you can kind of dab some of those oak tree seedlings with. Um, with the pecans and the other hickories, I like to leave those. <laughs> I, I, I encourage hickories to, to grow in my yard. So, uh, but I live in the woods. <laughs> uh, yeah, one thing I'll add: they make some. Um, they make some of these mechanical weed poolers, right? The root jacks or weed wranglers or extractigators. There's all sorts of little you know brands out there, and those things are pretty cool. I've used a couple of yeah. them, and you know a little you know, all you see is about, you know, eight inches of an oak little sapling. You carefully yank that thing. And actually after a rain is a really good time to do that, right? Because the soil is nice and moist, comes up easier. You can yank that sucker out and it's like two to three times the depth going down is roots, right? So they're pretty impressive, the root system they put into it. But these little mechanical weed pullers can be pretty helpful at you know, helping you get those little things out of there. Because otherwise you yank them and they snap off and you get all annoyed and they just keep coming back and back. So, but if you're mad, let the pecans and the hickories just let them have at it, right? Yeah. The, now the laurel oaks are another story. That's what usually pops right. up. But I gotta get rid of them. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Where am I going? We're going down here. We got a couple more questions. If you have questions out there in Zoom or Facebook land, put them in the chat. We'll answer them. Abby, again, I haven't heard you in a little while. So let's get you some questions. So here's a good one. We've talked about weeds and we talked at the beginning about what is a weed, but are any of these weeds beneficial for pollinators, Abby? Well, um, I mean, any flowering weed is good for pollinators. Native bees love flowering clover, dandelion, 
but two, it's also like we talked about earlier, what you deem as a weed, what's your plant out of place. Um, there are a lot of people nowadays that are letting their yards grow up to be kind of like a wildlife habitat in a sense, um, letting all the native stuff grow and just flower on its own. So just if you're not wanting to mow for a while, you could be a pollinator habitat at home. Um, but I mean, anything that flowers is great for pollinators. So if you don't think it's harming anything in your yard or in your garden and your front flower bed, then just leave it and let it be. So. Sounds good, Abby. It's, uh, Abby, you weren't here in March, but we do a whole no mow March thing where we basically encourage folks to like give it up for a month. Right. And you're su it's pretty surprising all the cool things that pop up. And usually, yeah, uh, pollinators are visiting those flowering weeds. So a lot of times if there's, you know, the pollinator insect activity in your lawn, the lawn's usually not what they're going for. They're, they're hitting up little flowering weeds that are mixed up in there. Mm -hmm. uh, Abby, one more question for you. Abby, do you have chickens? I don't, but I have you a don't. chicken coop that's vacant at my house right now. Uh, so it needs, sounds like you need to get it. some. Right. Um, any issues with feeding weeds to chickens? And now this is one of my favorite weed control methods recently because I have some really problematic plants that I can rake up, throw in the chicken coop, and they make sure those plants do not survive. So, but are there any, I got to be worried about feeding the chickens. There's a couple, um, but there's just, they're not necessarily deemed weeds, they can be plants, um, but definitely do your research on identification and what it looks like before you feed anything. Um, nightshade is a very common poisonous plant to any livestock um, across the board. Hemlock, um, azalea is not a weed, but that is another very common um, thing to find in your yard, especially in this area of Florida, the panhandle, um, that's very poisonous to livestock and poultry. Um, but like I said, just do your research on what you think might be poisonous. If you have a question, look it up, call your local extension agent. There's no harm in asking before you do anything. Um, you want to prevent obviously poisoning your chickens. You don't want to do that. Um, but there are a handful. And then I think I linked a publication that had a list of ongoing toxic plants to livestock and poultry, especially um, that Julie's going to link in the chat. So definitely take a read on it. And if you see anything that looks familiar in your yard, don't feed it to your chickens. So. Okay, thanks, Abby. Uh, let's see. I think we have reached, I got one here for Lawler, but there's no question I see there. So I think we've reached in. Did we get, do we have any Facebook questions that we need to answer? My moderators are out there. Any Zoom land questions you want to type in the chat or the Q&A and have us answer? I'm going to let you think on that, put your questions in there. And I'm going to tell you that next month we have our next um, Gardening the Panhandle Live. Uh, I can't remember the date, but you can find it on our Gardening the Panhandle webpage. It's going to be on growing herbs and I think uh, cool season veggies. So check us out for next month in October. I know we're also going to send you a, oh, there it is, October 12th, Cool Season Edibles. That'll uh, register for that. It's in this uh, chat. Also, uh, please take our survey. Right, We love that you joined us here today. Uh, we hope that you learned something. And that's what the survey is for, right? Did we, did we answer your questions? Did you learn something useful? What else are you interested in hearing? Uh, and maybe we'll contact you later and say, hey, did you, did you learn anything that really helped you with weed control down the way? So please in Zoom, Facebook, wherever you are, let's look for those links, um, sign up for the next one, take the survey. Uh, we did have a question come in from Facebook land. Uh, this isn't necessarily weed related, but we'll go ahead and throw it out there for you guys. Zoysia grass. Uh, is zoysia grass known for getting uh, fungus problems and what might they do for that? So this is a random one there. Who wants to take that one? TikTok. Oh, I guess I will. Unless Go you for it, Josh. Um, we work together. Well, all of your grasses can get funguses. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fungus is just a spore and it kind of lands where it lands. Um, when we talk about our, our pathogen triangle, we have the host, the pathogen, and the environment. Um, you want to knock out one of those three pillars and that'll prevent that from happening. So typically in our grasses, um, we only want half to three quarters of an inch of water, and we only want that when they show us the three signs that they want water. So those blades will fold in half. Because they fold in half, the light hits it a little bit differently. It takes on a blue-gray hue, 
And then if you were to grab your groceries and run into your house and look out five minutes later and you still have footprints in your lawn, you know you need to water. But when you water, you only want that half to three quarters of an inch. Um, and I don't know what you guys have seen around here, but I always see people, because of the heat, they think they need to water their lawns constantly. People do. And um, you don't. And so a lot of times when you overwater, you can start running into these fungal issues. And so yep. there are fungicides you can put down, but, and I'll let Matt speak to that. He's a little bit more keen on that. Um, but cutting up, cutting back that water will prevent a lot of these problems. So uh, one of the main diseases that we see in zoysia is large patch. And we used mm -hmm. to call that brown patch, but then we decided that brown patch is only for cool season turf and large patch is for warm season turf. Um, but you can put down a, a lot of different products. Uh, there's like chlorothalonil is a really common one and azoxystrobin and there's some other ones that end in the name strobin that you can find. Um, the thing is with that particular disease, it's one that we'll see coming up in the next uh, month or so because it's a like a cool season disease. Um, so right now or you know in a, a week or so would be a good time to put out one of those fungicides if you've noticed that disease in your turf in the past and that way you can kind of keep it from from spreading and moving it, it'll just it's called large patch for a reason it'll start small and just get bigger and bigger um, as the years go by um, so that that's one of the main ones that we see in, in zoysia turf okay well folks uh moderators or panelists here y'all did a great job thank you abby great job uh first guarding the panhandle live she did wonderful appreciate it josh and matt coming to us from santa rosa county uh, thank you to the moderators that are in the background we got carrie stevenson scott jackson and julie mcconnell that are you know handling all the other technological type things in the background there uh, so thank you all and thank you all for attending uh, everyone in Zoom and Facebook land. If you got questions, you know where to go now, right? You go to your local extension office, ask some great questions, and we will help you with some research-based uh, solutions. And we just hope to see you next time. Feel free to set, fill out the survey and join us next month to talk about herbs and cool season edibles. Anything else you guys want to say when you before leaving? Nope. Everyone's good? All right, get back to work, everyone, and have a great week, y'all. <laughs>